All right, testing, testing. Can anybody out there hear me? That's question number one. Why do I not see the stuff that I usually see? What's going on here? Is that because, no. What am I doing wrong? People can hear you. Weird. It's not the way it usually is. Why am I, why is going on here? Audience view, that's not it. What is that? The control panel? It used to be like a thing that I could see. All right, Greg says it sounds good. Um, all right, the hell with it. Whoa, what the hell was that? All right. Anyway, all right, so I'm going to try the screen now and see if that works. I have no idea why the little normal stuff that I see is not visible. So strange. Make another attendee, give control of the keyboard. No one can see you. People on your screens. All right, tell me when you guys can see me and we'll be in good shape. I, ah, why is this doing that? Auto hide the control panel. No, that's not it. Hide control panel. Default control panel layout. Oh, that looks more normal. All right, now it looks more like what I'm used to. Well, that's still not right. Audio, that's what I usually see. There you go, now I feel better, I can see the sound. But now I lost my question box. Wow, you can't win. All right, guys, <clears throat> I'm not done playing that. I'll figure it out some other time. Somehow all, all the choices changed on the thing. Oh, thanks, Greg, says he updated the interface since last webinar. Thanks a lot, people, of go to webinar, screwing me up. All right, anyway, so people can see it, people can hear it. That is exactly where we want to be. And we turn it over to Mrs. Roboto, and she will read the disclaimer. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed attract to monitored in virtual income. Virtual account pricing and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither Flips.world.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website, www.optionsclearing.com, to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss S you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right. <clears throat> so here's where we are, guys. We are... Oh, Tiff, that always screws me up. Do I do that as a computer do that by itself? That's my mind. I can never remember. That's what we were doing last week. So once again, we are... Blasting up 3150 is the um well 3135 actually is the is a line on the S P that we keep running into and failing. So we're kind of back there again. And the other indexes actually it's better to look at it in the futures charts, I think. So hang on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where are my futures charts? These are my futures charts. All right. So about five minutes, obviously. So, you know, taking the broader view, this is the line we keep failing on the Dow. This is the line we keep failing on the S&P. And, you know, it's, it's not a terrible thing. It's nothing wrong with consolidating here to move up. But usually if you're consolidating, you're going to consolidate along the place where you're going to break through. And in this case, it's a downside break. If we were going to consolidate up, we'd be more likely up here and consolidating. Doesn't you know? It's a, it's a not a, it's not obviously anything. TA is not a is not a strong indicator, but it's uh, interesting. Now the Nasdaq. See, okay, here's a good example. 
what did the NASDAQ do that these guys aren't doing? The NASDAQ consolidated up and then started breaking up, right? That's different. These are all consolidating down and are very, very close to a very dangerous breakdown that could take them all the way down to the next support, which is down here. All right, so that would totally suck. But where is that going to be? You're going to be, there's our 2850 line. It's a midpoint on, on the S&P, and we can go right back down to 26. You have to ignore the NASDAQ because it's being driven by like a few stocks. Um, insane stuff is happening in the NASDAQ. Tesla's flying up like a maniac. Um, it has nothing to do with reality. It's just like the old dot-com bubble. Um, just because you had the dot-com bubble back in 1999 doesn't mean you should buy GE for five times its value. You know, five, actually, because it's three times its value. And you say, well, Yahoo's 300 times its value. Why shouldn't we pay 50 times its value for GE? Because you're pricing, and, and again, I don't agree with the concept, but you're pricing a NASDAQ stock, and, and obviously not all NASDAQ stocks, blah, blah, blah. But you're pricing Apple, Facebook, Google, um, Amazon, whatever, for growth. So the expectation is, okay, fine, I'll pay 50 times now, but in 10 years, they'll be 10, they'll be two or three times bigger, and then I'll have only paid 20 times, and I'll be smart, right? Because But that makes no sense if you think about it, because if you just wait 10 years and you buy them then, then you'll pay 20 times earnings. They can't keep growing at that pace forever. It's not possible. There would be no retail left, and then how would Amazon grow? Like, imagine if Amazon were the only retailer. They would be doing terribly, right? They'd be the world's only retailer. And retail sales are slow and declining. They would be in horrible shape. Everybody would be worrying about Amazon going bankrupt, and then there'd be no retail left. Um, it's stupid. The model is stupid. The thinking is stupid. It doesn't make any sense, and it can't be sustained. But can't be sustained doesn't mean it can't go on for two years, three years, five years. Okay, there's no, there's no such thing as unsustainable in the short term. You don't you don't run out of stupid people and you don't run out of money. As, as anybody who anybody who belongs to a country club knows that, right? There's an infinite supply of dumb people with money. There's no question about that. Um, so you know, I mean, I know there's a logic that you can make good money chasing that. There's a lot of momentum traders do very well. I'm not one of them. I just, I'd rather, I would rather not participate. I don't have any desire to be sitting there thinking, well, let's see. I, I'm betting people are even dumber tomorrow than today and they're going to buy uh, Amazon for whatever the frick it is $3,000. And where, what are we up to today? It's, it's crazy. It's, it's irrational numbers. <clears throat> where is my thing? Um, that one. But you know. And I'll tell you what the logic is, because why not? I mean, there's really not that much movement today anyway. It's kind of boring. All right, so Amazon, it is 3000 It's getting up to $3,000. $1.4 trillion. That is, this was $2,000, guys. Okay, this was... Uh, two, uh, a year ago, uh, not a year ago, six months ago. This was right before the virus. <clears throat> so before, I understand you can see, you make a case for Amazon doing better because of the virus, but the world is kind of like, you know, entering into a huge depression. I don't think things are going to be that great going forward, even for Amazon. Um, but this is a play that a huge amount of retail is shifting towards Amazon, which is fine, but I've said many times, retail is not where Amazon wins. Amazon loses money selling retail. They make money selling cloud services. The cloud services originally were there to support their retail operation. It wasn't a service. It was they had a huge cloud computing system on a massive, massive scale. And they had it because they had to, they had to have a big enough system to handle Christmas. So because they had to have a big enough system to handle Christmas, that meant that the entire rest of the year, because don't forget stores do like 80% of their business is done Christmas time. So if you think about Amazon's cloud system, they have a system big enough to handle four, not four, 80% in 80 a month versus, yeah. So maybe five, six times more business in one month than they do all the rest of the year. But you have to have the system designed to do that, right? And what does the system have to do? It has to scale up quickly. It has to quickly handle an influx of orders and be able to, to move on the fly. So they had to solve all those problems in their cloud, 
their private little cloud, which at the time was called a wide area network or whatever it's you know, they had to, you know, it wasn't called a cloud at the time. And what they did is it was a server farm basically for Amazon. They have this huge server farm, did this and that. Then somebody came up with an idea of sharing it. It wasn't Amazon that came up with the idea of sharing it. Other people came up with the idea of sharing their server capacity. But then Amazon goes, hmm, light bulb moment. Don't we have incredible amounts of unused server capacity almost all year long? And so, yes, they did, right? So they begin selling all of their unused server capacity. But then it became a more of a business and they started adding more and more server capacity. So now they've got plenty of, of room for their own thing to spike up during Christmas and they can sell in unimaginable amounts of server power. That's what they're doing. And they call that the cloud. So Amazon makes all their money on the cloud because it kind of sprang out of nothing. They didn't have to do R&D. They didn't have to build it from scratch. It was a cost of doing retail. And that's where they have such an advantage over everybody else on cloud services and such. But they made like $3 billion on cloud services last year and lost $2 billion on retail. That was their operation. Retail is not profitable. It's, and, and, and you can ask Walmart, nobody does retail, Amazon does not do retail better than Walmart. Oh, that was right last quarter, not last uh, year. They, 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 you know, they're putting up good numbers, $11 billion, but it's on 280 million sales. And that's what, what's 11 into 280? I cannot do the math today. 11 divided by 280, 34%. So they, their margin is not really different than Walmart, except that the secret is, this is all cloud computing margin. This is not, really money this is not retail money they're not making money selling retail so when you see amazon i would actually be concerned that if their retail operation is really up this much they're not making that much money and we'll see that in the numbers this quarter um and i'm not saying short of amazon because it, it, again you're paying a huge amount of money for amazon because they're the future but it is 1.4 trillion dollars and this is only uh, ten billion dollars, and I'm pretty sure it's 140 times. So one four oh yes, of course, times ten is 14. That doesn't make any sense. 1.4 times 10 is 14 billion. No, wait a minute. Yeah, it's a hundred. It's a hundred times earnings. Thank you. Okay, there you go. So it's a hundred times earning. Or no, why am I doing this wrong? All right. I tell you, my brain is so fried. All right, so we have a 1400, that's how many billions, divided by, well, 10 is 140. I keep getting the same thing. All right, <clears throat> it seems so crazy. So you're paying 140 times the earnings for Amazon. Well, isn't that special, right? Um, so you're anticipating that either they will become more efficient at selling, which frankly, I don't believe that's true. I don't think, I think <clears throat> there's nothing more efficient than Walmart. Because think about what Walmart does. Walmart doesn't, um, I mean, Amazon's got the staffing advantage, I guess, but Walmart, who is also doing very well, frankly, uh, Four hundred billion dollar company, but but got totally or, or got totally eclipsed by Amazon. Four hundred billion dollar company, fifteen billion dollars in profits, rock steady money, going through. So they are only. I, it's still crazy for Walmart. They're only twenty times sales. That's a lot for Walmart. Twenty twenty two, whatever the hell it is. Um, so Walmart like twenty two times sales. And Amazon, 140 times sales, revenue, sorry, sorry, profit. And um, that's crazy, okay? Because if Amazon gets as big as Walmart, Amazon sells half as much as Walmart, Walmart is dropping 15 to the bottom line. Like I said, though, this is real retail. And they're still 15 divided by 534. So that's uh, 15 divided by 534, 20%. Amazon's margins on retail are less than 2.8%. Their margins on cloud are astronomical and make it look better than it is. So the question with Amazon is really not so much can they take over all of retail and wipe out the planet and so on and so forth. I mean, look, Walmart already did that. 
And that's another thing. People ask me if retail can survive Amazon. And I'm like, well, they survived Walmart. Right? They adapted. They got hurt. It was painful. But the retailers basically survived. And Walmart is just a store now. It was taking over the world. They stopped. Okay? But no one ever valued Walmart at 140 times earnings. This 23 times earnings is crazy for them. But you're talking about Amazon. 140 times earnings, how are they going to grow into that? Are they going to double their sales and be selling as much as Walmart? Is Amazon and Walmart going to be 20% of all the sales on the planet? Because Walmart's about 10 now. Um, not on the planet, America. Um, and, then, um, and then even so, how are the profits going to be? 30? Between, you know, they're going to get to 30 billion between them? So 20%, they'll make 30 billion, and that's even giving Amazon's cloud advantage and doubling them up. That still doesn't justify those kind of market caps, not in any way, shape, or form. So then Amazon has to double up again. And how long is that going to take? How long is it going to take Amazon to add another Walmart? They would have to double and add another Walmart, another 10% of all retail would have to be Amazon. That would basically mean one third of all retail on the planet is Amazon. And still, you're at 30 something times earnings still it's just not rational if anything goes wrong in the next 20 years of getting to that cycle they're, they're going to crash like crazy if anything goes wrong of course something's going to go wrong something always goes wrong something went wrong with ibm something went wrong with at t something goes wrong with everybody so that's i mean look that that it comes back down to that's a whole nasdaq you know, you, I mean, you want to see insanity. Look at this freaking thing. And what the, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> we just shorted it though. So we're in good shape. Um, we, what, what is going on here with this comp, with the stock? What is going on with people? What are they thinking? $207 billion for a company that makes nothing never made anything no freaking way elon musk is pushing his people to make break even this quarter that was in the paper the other day he's telling them to push hard so they can break even now think about that because they have to push hard to break even they're supposed to make 731 million dollars this year which is still nothing compared to their market cap and uh, Yahoo, 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 there it is. And so last quarter, financials and quarterly. So last quarter, they made nothing. I guess they didn't lose. How do they make nothing three quarters in a row? That can't be right. Basic EPS, diluted EPS, normalized income, net income, EBITDA. Something's weird about their numbers, huh? Where is this coming from? Well, let's look at this one. See, stock, stock. I pay for the other one, so let's see what they say. That seems very odd, right? Let's go to uh, balance sheet. Here you go. Income statement. Thank you. <laughs> Something's really off. How do you make exactly zero? Net income, here you go. So the last few quarters, that's Q1, $16 million, 16, yeah, that's not billion, that's $16 million. 105 million in Q4, 143 in the quarter before that. Okay, fine. We know they had the virus problem here. Last year, they were losing 702, lost 48, made 143, that's a quarter. And they made 105, but now we start this year at 16. He's trying to break even in Q2. How on earth are they going to make $700 million? How are they going to make th double that amount? No, three times that amount. No, no, wait, no, 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 two and a half. All right, so how are they going to make two and a half times their best quarter ever in Q3 and Q4? Is that likely? No, it's not likely. And even if it happened, it's still not even getting them close to where they need to be to justify this insane price. 
And I want to let's get back to the other thing for the main screen. Get back. Okay. Get back to the main screen. Now let's, you know, let's look at the kind of close. Here's Tesla. $27 billion in revenue. Doesn't make any money at all. You know, I mean, $700 billion. Valued 200 times their earnings. Okay. Doesn't make any money. Never made money. Says they're going to make money, but haven't actually proved it yet. $200 billion. Okay. Here's the second biggest automaker in the world, Toyota. Remember that $26 billion, right? That's their total sales. Here's Toyota. Oh, I thought they were second. I thought, I thought Tesla passed them, but I guess not. Oh, no, 171. They did pass them. What's that? Inter oh, that's their value. They're undervalued. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. Um, here's Toyota. Oh, it's in yen. You sons of bitches. Anyway, um, 290, just divide by 100, it's easier. $290 billion in sales, 10 times, more than 10 times Toyota. $20 billion in profit. So it's yen, you divide by 100. So $20 billion in profit, $300 billion in sales. And that company, you can buy $471 billion for less than Tesla. They make 10 times more money than Tesla with 10 times more sales. 10 times more than Tesla wishes they were going to make. It's like the speed on Tesla, it's ludicrous. And people are selling Toyota and buying Tesla. So, by the way, you know, this is a problem. When I try to like close out a portfolio, I'm, I'm always, I'm immediately like going, ooh, Toyota. I'm trying to I'm trying to shut down the positions and then I'm like, oh Toyota, wow, we don't have that. Let's get that. And then we don't have anything. I immediately want to start buying again because it's just so annoying. When you see, you know, when something's undervalued, it's undervalued. Um I, I'm a very valued person. I mean, that's the I think in my whole life I'm always like that. So I mean if you know if I, I I'm if I see a really good deal on like a condo or beach house or something like that, and I'm like, oh, I could rent that out and do this and that, you know, I want it. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm looking for it, if I have a reason to have it. I'm like, it's a value. I want to do something with it. I can make something out of that. Um, businesses too. If a, if a business is a good value, I want to buy the business. I want to work with it. Um, you gotta, uh, you gotta look for values. You gotta, and, and then same thing, something overpriced. If somebody offers me a stupid price, like, my house in uh, New Jersey in 19, uh, when was the crash? In Sorry, not 19. In 2006, I believe it was, probably before things softened a bit. So right when things were racing up in 2006, these people offered us um, $900,000 for a house we had paid $400,000 for, you know, a long time. Oh, ten, no, 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 10 years earlier, really. Literally, yeah, in fact, almost exactly. 10 years earlier, I'd moved into the house. We paid $400,000, and these guys offered us $900,000. And I said to my wife, I'm like, you have got to take this. And she's, you know, and of course we didn't because she's got the children in school, blah, blah, blah. We got our friends, our family. I'm like, I will take an apartment down the street. And I told her, I said that at the time. I said, I will go move down the street, get an apartment, nice apartment, $4,000 a month. We'll pay $80,000 to live there for two years, and then we'll buy this house back for $500,000. I'm like, this is insane. And you've got to know when somebody's when something is overvalued, and you've got to know when something is undervalued. So of course, moral story, we sat in the house, the price crashed, and we never got that kind of money again. So, you know, it's like you have to know when you're getting a good deal. You have to understand what a good deal is and what a bad deal is. And and it doesn't matter what the momentum is or what the market's doing or anything like that. This is a good deal. This company's making $20 billion a year, and you can buy it for $18 billion. That is, um, yeah, it's not even 10 times earnings. 10 times earnings would be $200 billion. It's not a $200 billion company. I mean, it's probably not 100 yen in a dollar anymore either. I'm so old. <laughs> I'm so old, I'm like stuck on like the last time I went to Japan, it was 100. What are, where are we at now? I'm 93. It's not terrible. Okay, so so not not really. It is about that. So, but but really, 
how can anybody even entertain this concept? Forget the other, forget the debt, forget everything else, and so on and so forth. How can you possibly take this company with this sales and this earnings and even put it in the same ballpark as Tesla? It's it's just nuts. And a lot of the NASDAQ is based on that. And it's the same thing that happened in 1999. And the same thing that happened in 2006 and 7 also. We had the same discussion about the banks back then. JP Morgan. Then, then it wasn't it, then it was the real estate companies and it was the banks. The real estate boom was being driven by people who were flipping and they would change they the same house would get sold like three times in three months. It was crazy. Everybody's trading houses like like nuts. And it made the market seem really, really hot, but it was just the same market going back and forth between idiots, the same house going back and forth between idiots, and someone is stuck holding it. But you know what's funny about the housing market is you don't have to sell it. So what happens is it always seems better than it is when, when it's hot because, you know, I I sell a house, you, I buy a house for $400,000, okay? And let's say I sold it to somebody else for six, and then that guy sells it to the dumb guy who was trying to buy my house for nine. So you know, everybody's making money, right? Everybody's making money, but the dumb guy who buys my house for nine is stuck with it. But you don't see that. It's not reflected in the numbers because housing is not actively traded. And um, you have the same problem when you look at a slowly traded um, um, an option. So when you look at option contracts and you see sl very low activity, it means you're probably not getting a really good idea of the price of the real value of an option because who knows what the real demand is? Who knows if you can actually sell this thing? That's why you always have to be careful about thinly traded stocks. Even if even a stock that has a thin cap. Oh, speaking of speaking of thinly traded, I don't know if the numbers are here, but no. Tesla is a thinly traded stock because Tesla has no float. And let's take a look at that for a second. Just to, I don't know why I don't want to get on about Tesla, frankly, because it's who cares. But um oh, we care because we have a short, but I'm just, you know. So I guess we care a little bit. But anyway, so statistics, I think that is. All right, yeah. So da, 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 da. here we go. Look, float. 147 million shares traded. Okay, there's only 147, 20% held by bit insiders, 57% by institutions. That means 77% of 147 million share percent are held by people who are not really sellers. They're generally holders. Of the shares, of the shares that's in, also there's 15 million shorts, also almost 10% of the stock is shorted. That's another bunch of, of longs that aren't likely to sell. They've, they've already got short sellers. They've already committed their stock. So very, 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 very thinly traded. And if you go to like, by comparison, Toyota, and you look at their statistics, what happened? Have to go to statistics. That's not statistics. Oh, yeah, it is. What do you know? You go to statistics on Toyota. Their float is 1.2 billion shares. They have 10 times more stock than Tesla. Kind of coincidence, but maybe not. Um, and no, and look, nobody shorts them. 300,000 shorts, not even a million shorts. Okay, they're not a shorted stock. That means, that means they're not going to get squeezed either, like Tesla's being squeezed right now. But they're not even they're not even a shorted stock. They've got 1.3 billion. They're super liquid by comparison, and they don't have a large percentage of institutions, insiders, no insiders, institutions, one percent institution. Toyota is held by insiders and institutions, and they manipulate and squeeze and push that stock up all the time. And does that mean it's a good stock to get into? No, because one day they'll let the bottom fall out because it's a JP Morgan trick, right? Um, I always forget the exact quote, but you know what I mean. It's a, I keep putting it up there. JP Morgan says a market correction is a time when the uh, when the assets are returned to their rightful owners. And what does he mean by that? JP Morgan means that the, the idiot who bought my house for $900,000 or wanted to buy my house for $900,000 that guy was a sucker. He bought at the top of the market. I'm the rightful owner of that house. But you know what? When he offers me $900,000, I am temporarily willing to sell it to him 
knowing that there will eventually be a correction at which time I could buy the house back. And that goes for my stocks too. When I sell a stock, I don't sell Apple because I don't like it anymore. I sell Apple because it's 350 freaking dollars. That's why I sell Apple. It's too much now. You have to have a price in your head that's too much, not just a price that's too low. Otherwise, you're not going to be an effective trader. Apple, $1.6 trillion at $366. $1.6 trillion. And Apple, where's Apple's little chart? Apple. <laughs> So Apple, since the crisis began, let's call it 320, is up 40 bucks, is up 10, 15%, whatever the hell that number is. Because what? People buy more phones in a crisis? I'm not sure what the logic is here. And there is no logic. It's just inflating with everything else because there's all this money flowing into the market. And this morning I talked about that. We were talking about... Um, Oops, we were talking about the uh, the amount of money the Fed's putting to work in the corporate bomb and the junk bomb market. I don't want to say, I didn't even say corporate bond, it's junk bond. Make sure everybody understands it's junk, it's trash, it's stuff you shouldn't buy. The Fed is buying all of it. Um, and look how famous Fauci is. You know you're famous when somebody can recognize you from like a, from that picture, you can be easily recognized. It's like, that. oh, that's Fauci. It's not even a question. Um, so let's say an interesting turn in his life that he became one of the most famous people in America. Uh, so anyway, he's freaking out and he should be because of this. I'd be freaking, I'm, I, I'd be freaking, I am freaking out too, because he understands the numbers. I understand the numbers. You're not putting this genie back in the bottle. We took emergency measures here because it was getting out of control. We have not taken emergency measures here and it's getting more out of control. This caused a recession. What is this gonna cause? It's not complicated. He's saying not 50,000 a day, we are pathing to 100,000 a day, which would be up here. Probably maybe, maybe this long, let's say we do this long. A hundred thousand days. Just imagine this little out this little chart going you do 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 and out of here. And we're at a hundred thousand a day. And America is shut off from the rest of the world. We already are. We can't go anywhere. I can't go to Europe. I can't go to traveling. I can't go anywhere this summer. I can go to America, but I mean, you know. So, so you know, we you can't go anywhere. Nobody can come here, can't conduct business by live, they have, can't have meetings, can't have conferences. Vegas, it doesn't matter. Vegas can open up and put on a conference. Nobody can come. Only people from America can go to Vegas conferences. Because you have to quarantine for like two weeks on arrival. But we can't even go. We can't even go to those countries. We're not allowed. <laughs> so, so Trump has successfully built his wall, and the wall is keeping us in and keeping everybody else out. But we're not, we're the ones inside the wall. And, and you call those prisons, I think, in the old days. I'm not sure what they call it now. Now we call, now we call it America, I guess. Um, so here we are all together in lockup. And, uh, you know, it's like you don't realize it because the walls are far away, but they're there. We can't get out. My daughter can't, I can't see my daughter graduate. My daughter can't come see me after she graduates because there's the quarantines for Florida and New Jersey. It's crazy. And and soon you're going to have to show your papers when you want to board public transportation like the Germans made you do, right? Papers, please. You're going to have that. You're going to have to show your virus papers that you were that you are approved to travel and so on and so forth. And and what do you where do you think it started? How do you think all that stuff started in Germany? That's how dictators take control. They start telling they start limiting your freedom in the name of safety. And you know, Jefferson warned us about that. Benjamin Franklin said, those who sacrifice um, safety for comfort shall have neither. No, those who sacrifice freedom for comfort shall, wait, what was it? Yeah. Those who sacrifice freedom for comfort shall have neither. That's what it is. So in other words, if, you're, if you want to be comfortable or safe, 
and you give up your freedoms to be comfortable or safe, and you're not even really safe, but that's beside the point. But if you want to believe you're comfortable or safe, and you give up your freedom to do so, and you give up and you infringe on the freedom of other people so that you feel more comfortable and more safe, which is kind of what the whole Black Lives Matter thing is about, then you are neat, you're going to be neither comfortable or safe. It does not work. That's not how you solve a problem by building walls and fencing people in and keeping people out, and making rules and so on and so forth. You educate the population, you equip the population to fight a disease for the common good and we all band together and do so. That's how you fix something. That's how Asia is fighting the virus successfully. That's how most of Europe is fighting the virus successfully. That's why idiot countries like Russia, America, Brazil, they, and, the, and even the UK all have idiot populist presidents, whatever they are, and they all are screwing, screwed up the whole virus thing completely. You know, Italy had other problems. Italy actually had a worse strain of the virus than we do. That's one of their problems. Another problem is Italy had an incredibly old population. That's another problem. Another problem is Italy is a very, very, very dense country. Uh, it's a very touristy country. Rome rivals New York for number of tourists and such. Um, that's that's why Italy got hit so hard. You know, not because they did anything wrong. They just like New York City. What are you going to do? We all live on top of each other. You know, in New York, it's like, what are you supposed to do? How do you stay six feet away from people in New York City? How can you? My my building. I thank God I live on the ground floor. My building has on the elevator which i do have to use sometimes but it's got a sign saying uh in the interest of social distancing please try not to use the elevator if somebody else is in it well that'd be great if they had 20 elevators like some giant hotel but they don't so what are you supposed to do and i guess take the stairs but that's not you know that's not my thing <laughs> but even in the stairs right you should stay away from people it's like these aren't solutions these are band-aids we're not fixing anything and in New York, in those big apartment buildings, are you kidding me? You're going to sit there and wait for an empty elevator? You know, you guys go to hotels. You know what that's like. If you, even if you're not like a, a city person, you know, you've been to hotels. You know what it's like to try to, to get an elevator. It's never going to be empty. And that means immediately you've got people within six feet of you. That's even if you're being super careful, you can't help it. Then you walk outside, the revolving door, the thing that's there, the guys at the subway. I forget the subway. I mean, see, that's where it all spread it anyway. Um, it's a disaster. This is a disaster. And we're not fixing it because our leadership isn't fixing it and it's just getting worse. So there we are. Happy Wednesday. How are we doing? Market is still flat, so who cares? All right, good. We can just talk about nonsense. Then. So what was I going to say I was talking about? Oh, the virus is right. Who cares? I'm going to move past that. This is what I care about, the Fed. So here's the Fed. This is just one bond. This is just the I3, blah, 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 whatever the hell it is. Who cares? But But... There is the Zero Hedge article, which I linked to. It's got many examples, and it's the same all the time. The Fed owns unbelievable amounts. It's, I mean, obviously, so does Fisher. This is Fisher. So does Bank of America. You know, these are big bond buyers. Fine. But the Fed didn't used to be one. They're buying up tremendous amounts of bonds, continuing to buy these bonds. They're picking up all of the junk bonds. The ETFs in turn turn around and create a demand in the bond market and allow the corporations to issue more and more bonds. That's what's going on. So it makes companies that should not, it, it's an illusion. It's all part of this whole illusion they create. And, and it's not by accident because they say, how do we make sure everybody thinks interest rates should be low all the time? Well, we certainly have to buy up all the uh, treasury bills at auction. When the, when the government's borrowing money, we have to buy up all that debt. Oh, where are we at? Da, 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 da. Yeah, 26279. Fantastic. All right. So we have to buy we have to buy this. Okay. Every 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 day, more and more and more and more, right? Are these still going down? I can't even tell it's so fast. Wait, seven, six, yep. Revenues is still dropping. Remember, I told you that was the biggest the bigger problem. Revenues are collapsing because people aren't working. That's payroll tax collapsing. People aren't making money. Income tax is collapsing. So the government is collecting now $2.8 trillion in payroll tax and whatever. How about the corporations? Are they making money or losing? Nope, corporations are losing money too. You know, that's interesting. It's a very good gauge of the health of the economy because you look at the corporate tax revenue, and if it's going backwards, probably things aren't that good. 
That means the estimated collection of corporate tax revenue, which is disgusting, by the way, I will tell you that because you were talking about they pay $215 billion in taxes versus, and they, and they, and by the way, they pay this even when it goes up, even when this is normal. But generally, we have $3.5 trillion in payroll and income tax. They pay $215 million. And they and they're the ones paying us. They make plenty of money. They make more money than we do, but they pay one one fifteenth of the tax. That's crazy. But you know, obviously, total disaster. And uh, again, it's like, how do you maintain a large portfolio in this kind of condition? Just because the market went up and you say, oh, gosh, I, I don't want to miss a rally. Okay. Nobody in 2007 wants to miss a rally. That's exactly what happened. I told people, and, I, and I'll admit I was too early. I, in all of 2007, the summer of 2007, I started saying the sky is falling. I said, this can't last. This is bullshit. There's, these numbers are not supportable. Same thing I was telling you just now. The bank numbers could not be supportable. There isn't this much money. Me and Warren Buffett were saying that there just isn't this much money in the universe. Therefore, they can't be making this money in reality. It can't be happening. There must be something strange going on. And what was going on was they were selling subprime mortgages, bundling them up, treating them like they were prime mortgages, making a fortune. But when, when the underlying housing values collapsed, there was nothing to sustain all this paper. And there were... There were trillions of dollars of paper covering hundreds of billions, you know, there were trillions of dollars of paper covering hundreds of billions of dollars of mortgages. It was a hundred times, a thousand times more paper than there were actual mortgages because they'd been sold and bundled and resold and sold again and sold again and sold again. So all it took was the one little mortgage that was real to collapse and all the paper started collapsing around it. And that's an out of control market. That was that was going to happen. There was no way it wasn't going to happen. But I got sick and tired of talking about it. And then the market crashed anyway. But we didn't do so badly. We knew it was going to crash. But that was beside the point. It was just insane. You know, it's funny. It's not that hard to go back to 2007, was it? Oh, let's say 322. Look at this. It's crazy. Well, maybe not 322. That's interesting. Oh, oh, it's coming up with something. Oh, it was more than that. Wow, good guess. All right, 2009. So let's say another 92. All you have to do is put the page number up and you'll get back at like pretty good stuff. Ah, oh, yeah, here we go. Well, let's say then it's going to be 400. So this is 400 and. Uh, 12 articles ago. There we go. TSO and Exxon puts. Interesting to see what we're doing. Monday mop up. Yada yada. <laughs> that was funny. Oh God, I'm funny. All right. Where are we? Um, virtual portfolio moves, blah, 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 Las Vegas, da da, Apple, market madness up and away super see how oh, that's right i was calling it supermarket at the time because like you just would never stop going down it was invulnerable unfortunately that's when the market's chest stands for the dollar which is down one percent today trading blah 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 you know it's like same kind of observations i make all the time but it's just the fundamentals they weren't there all right i, I here yet here i am back in 2007 saying this is bullshit enjoy it while you can this is a load of nonsense it's not going to last you know, but it lasted another year. I was wrong. It lasted another year. It didn't really do fantastic for another year, but it lasted another year. It didn't collapse all at once. So, you know, it's hard for me to close down everything and shut down the portfolios because I, I say, well, what if I'm wrong again? What if it's another year? What if I'm, what are we going to sit here for a year and stare at the market? No, of course, we're going to trade. But I don't know. I mean, that's, that's where the trouble is. It's like this, it's a stock trading site. We should be trading some stocks, but that doesn't mean we have to sit on portfolios like idiots and watch them run out of money. What's really fun is having money, waiting for a collapse, and then rebuilding. That's what's fun.
And when I say, well, blah, 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 reprint, oh, I said, I was going off on stuff. Portfolio, boy, wow, we have really evolved. Look how, look how my portfolio things used to be. Man, I work so much harder now. I never realized that. No wonder I'm tired. Well, Bernanke blesses with a bushel of bucks. You know, and I, I didn't do pictures back then. That's interesting. No, I did. I think they strip the pictures because they get old and then the links die. Because I, we don't, we don't copy pictures. We post links to the picture because of uh, copyright issues. So we don't want to dump them on our website on our website because that's uh, stealing the image. So I guess the links get old after a while, and then you can't count on them, and there's probably too many bad links, and so they decided to remove the links. That would be my guess. I was not involved in that decision process. Anyway, so obviously this went on for quite some time, right? I mean, this is how the market was back then. So. You know, if, I, if I'm going to say, I think we should dump our portfolios, I want you to understand my thinking. My thinking is based on the fact that 10 years ago, I did the same thing, but we didn't dump our portfolios and we took a hell of a hit. And so what's the difference if we make 20% more over the next year, if we're going to suddenly lose 50% of it, 50% of the whole thing, of 120, then we're only up six, then we're at 60%. You know, we gain we gain twenty percent more. Go to you know, we go to one hundred and twenty percent of where we are now, but then the market drops sixty percent, or fifty or fifty percent, and then suddenly we're at sixty percent of where we are now, or a little higher than that. What's the point? Then why would I do that? So it's a tough spot for me, and I'm letting you know it's a tough spot for me. I'm letting you know that I'm considering it very heavily. Um, today's thing with Tesla was a good example of why you can't count on hedges sometimes because you can get blown out of a hedge. We got blown out of our Tesla hedge because unexpectedly Tesla went up a hundred bucks in two days. You know, we adjusted, but in the short run, the short-term portfolio takes a big hit. Whoops. There it is, 350%, it's 450%, so it's down 100,000 bucks because of that. And, and, and it was up and now it's down. It's not, it's not just that, of course. It, so, so the market's up and Tesla in particular is up and we got hit for $64,000 on that. This one, I don't care about the 950, I'm, I'm, it's just a short put and we can sell against it. I care about this one. This one burnt the crap out of us. It was $46,000 credit. Now we have to pay $111,000 to get out of it. That's what's killing the portfolio right now. Everything else is fine. Long-term portfolio, that's not going to find it. So, you know, that was my concern. This is too crazy of a market to really protect ourselves adequately. Now, long-term portfolio is 865. So that the other one was like 450, so 450, 865, 12, 13. So yeah, we, we're down about we're down less than 100, but around you know we're getting close to 100 thousand dollars in a week. Uh, obviously, because Tesla wrecked the protection issue of the short-term portfolio. So instead of protecting us, we took a loss. All right, will we make that money back? Well, unless Tesla becomes the uh, I don't know, unless Tesla starts being worth more than Walmart, which is on its way right now, um, <laughs> I guess, I get. I don't think so. I really can't see how Tesla can be worth more, more than Walmart, but then who's, uh, who on earth is checking these things, right? Isn't that crazy? Walmart is, yep, 339, Tesla's on the way. Because what? Because they make some electric cars at a break-even price. They make $26 billion worth of electric cars. And people are going to throw $177 billion at the company? Five times sales? That's nuts. So the market is nuts. It's not just because of Tesla. Amazon's nuts, too. Netflix is nuts. A lot of these companies are nuts. And they all have four letters in their name. 
I don't see how that's going to last. I really don't. It just doesn't make any sense. And and again, it's the housing thing because it was. I said the same thing back then, more than ten years ago now, and I said it over and over and over again, and it got boring. And I know it gets boring, and I know I sound negative. And I know people don't like that and they want to hear happy thoughts and hear about how great everything is because obviously don't, you know, it's, we don't sit here at home in our living room or wherever wanting to hear all the bad things that you were trying to get away from or distract ourselves from. I understand that, but you know, this is a financial site and it's about your money and we got to make sure we actually take care of that. And let me tell you something. If the worst case happens and we're really, really close to the worst case, and if the worst case happens and we have a global depression, it's going to be so much worse. And, 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 and every penny you have is going to be worth two or three pennies. That's the thing also. If you have cash in an economic downturn and you can, you can buy stores that you like, you can buy uh, houses you like, you know, if you have cash, you can do anything you want. And people are thrilled that you can give them some of your cash because it becomes hard to come by. And then that seems crazy while the Fed is printing money like crazy, but that's what happens. All of a sudden, all these things that you think are worth money turn out not to be worth money, the whole system collapses, all the money vanishes in a puff of smoke, just like Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan. Literally went from forecasting $20 billion profits to showing $20 billion losses in the quarter, in one quarter. We're gonna make this and that and all these derivatives and this and that and all this thing and the, the paper and the mortgage-backed securities and this and that. Uh, all of a sudden, it crashed really hard and fast, and they're like, uh, we have to write down like three quarters of paper that we thought was worth something and turns out to be not worth anything, and help government, help, help. That's what that is. It's the same thing. You, as an investor, if you're buying Tesla, you're saying, well, you know what, Mr. Government? You know, we, we, we know we only make, you know, uh, I can't even uh, see again. I cannot do math. All right. Let's say Tesla sells cars for $50,000 just for argument's sake. They don't, but so they got 25 billion in sales, right? Yes. Divided by $50,000 cars, half a million cars. There you go. That's about right. Right. So. Tesla makes half a million cars. Great. And you're paying $177 million for Tesla, right? So now we got some numbers to work with. So 177, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and another 1, 2, 3. So you're paying $177 billion for Tesla. You're willing to go 20 times earnings. So divide by 20. All right. Still 8.85 billion is kind of respectable. Now we divide that by 500,000 cars. And you need Tesla to make $17,000 per car. That's your break even. If you want Tesla to be worth 20 times earnings, you need Tesla. That's how you work these things out. You have to understand the mechanics of like the whole formula and do it backwards, forward, sideways. You got to figure out what are your variables that you can hold, what, what variables are fixed, what variables are not fixed, and work that equation, it's just basically algebra. Um, so in this case, we know Tesla has to make $17,700 a car to justify the market cap they're at now in a normal market, not that we have a normal market, not that we're gonna have a normal market for, 20, for 10 years, but in a normal market, if there ever is one, they should be about 20 times earnings a car to the company. Therefore, they gotta show us the money at 17,700 a car. Now, obviously that's never gonna happen, they have $35,000 cars. Their current margins on cars are negative. They got a long way to go. But then you go to Mr. Toyota and you say, well, now that's how you can find out what a car is really worth. So somebody remember 17.7. And now we say 
this is the research part of my job now. We say, how many cars does Toyota, oops, Toyota sell a year? I see somebody always asks the same question you did. 10.6 million. Okay, that's very, very interesting. So Tesla makes 20, well, there we go. So 17, 7, right? Divided by Tesla makes 20 times more cars. Is that right? Yeah. Tesla makes 20 times more cars than, than Toyota. So they only have to make $800 a car to justify Tesla's market cap. They're doing that now. They're, they're, they're over and above where they need to be, Toyota. Tesla is 20 times behind. So either they need to have 20 times more sales, and don't forget they're not even making the profit. We're just giving them the benefit of the doubt and saying that they can make Tesla's profit. I mean, Toyota's profit, sorry. So we're just giving Tesla the benefit of the doubt and saying they're gonna make Toyota's profit. But they're not. They're nowhere close now, and why would we think they're gonna do better? But even if they match Toyota's profit, they have to then sell, now then, now so that we're matching the profit, that means now we still need to move the variable. So the variable has to be they sell 20 times more vehicles, 10 million cars. Toy Tesla has to sell as many cars as Toyota, which has, oh, see, here you go, more, more research. This is how I read an article. You guys don't realize it, it just takes me a long time. Uh, you, you think I have these things in my head. How many factories? Factories does Toyota have? Wow, came right up. They have 14 manufacturing plants. The Toyota, is that North America or is that everywhere? No, North America alone. Well, that's, that's not a good answer. They only make two, okay, there you go, two million cars. So if they make two million cars in America and they have 10 million total and that's 14, you know what I could do this math is 90, right? 14 times five seventy. Oh, I can't do the math. I'm telling you guys. <laughs> so my schedule these days is not good. It's not it's not conducive to this. <laughs> so wow, why do you think that was nice? So stupid. All right, anyway, 70. So Toyota has roughly, we don't know for sure, but, but I mean, if you extrapolate what they have in America, Toyota's got like 70 plants. Oh, here you go. You can find out the exact number here, but who cares? All right. So for, for argument's sake, though, Toyota's got 70 plants. Tesla has what? Two, three, four. I think, I think three. I think I'm pretty sure it's three. So Tesla's got three plants. How long will it take Tesla to catch up to Toyota in number of plants? And I know there are probably Tesla people who are, well, you know, we're more efficient and blah, 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 blah. No, you're not. Okay, you only make half a million cars in three plants, okay? Tesla makes two million cars in 14 plants in America. You have, well, you have three plants in the car. But the bottom line is Tesla only makes half a million cars total, worldwide. Three plants. They make 125,000 uh, cars per plant. And Toyota has 14 plants in the U.S. making two million cars. So they make uh, uh, 700, wait, is that, is that right? 700,000? Yeah, 14. Manual, oh, wait, wait, okay, sorry. So you get 2 million cars divided by 14, 142,000. So Toyota makes the same or actually more cars per plant than Tesla. Let's say the same though. I don't think Tesla really makes 500,000 cars. So here's another question. How many cars did Tesla sell in 2018? Oh, 367,000 cars. So hopefully, well, hopefully this year they'll make it. So for argument's sake, let's say that Tesla and, and Toyota are similarly efficient. But again, the whole valuation of Tesla is not based on reality. It's based on a fantasy that they don't need to obey the laws of physics, that their car plant is going to put out more cars than Toyota, that they're going to have better quality, better efficiency, make more money per car, that the people at Toyota are idiots, and the people at Ford are idiots, and the people at GM are idiots, and only Elon Musk knows how to make $17,000 with every car he makes 
instead of the thousand dollars that everybody else makes. And it's a ridiculous, completely flawed, utterly useless assumption. But that doesn't stop the stock from going up because it's thinly traded, it's highly, uh, highly recognizable, it's desirable for people who have money. It makes a statement, I own some of Tesla, I'm a Tesla stockholder, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of that going on also. And again, there's so few of the stocks that is held like Bitcoin. You know, as much as Tesla is now, you know, three, whatever, you know, whatever it's 360 or whatever. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not 360, that's Apple. Um, whatever the hell they're at now, 2,000 bucks or something. Um, where are we at? T S. Should know. I just so oh nine a thousand. Ah, not that one. That would be funny. Nice crash. There you go. All right. So a thousand bucks, not two thousand bucks yet. So that's nice. Oh, we did a good job. We sold it. We sold those options here. We sold the short calls. Um. So, and and again, value. You know, you got it. I didn't make a move. We stayed with it because it's going to come back at some point anyway. We're no one going to roll those calls. But when it got to this point here, getting towards 1150, and I saw the price that I could sell the, what were they, the 1250 calls for in, in September or something? I'm like, sell those. You can't not sell them. Some moron is willing to pay you $100 for the 1250 calls as if this is normal. It's not normal at all. And if you if you don't take advantage of the EDC, then then you're not really playing the stock market correctly. Somebody's got to be the sucker. It's like poker, you know. Somebody's going to have to lose, and you don't want it to be you. So don't play their game. Don't play their game. Don't put your money into a bad pot. Don't put your money into a pot where you don't know what's going on. Don't put your money into a pot just to see what happens. These are like really hard, fast, basic rules of poker, and they're hard and fast rules for trading too. Just because everybody else throws money into a pot doesn't mean you should. In fact, that's the worst thing you can do. And I mean, I don't want to get into all the poker thing, but like, you know, you could have, let's say you have a nice hand. Let's say you have like a, a king and a jack. It's a pretty good hand, okay? But if you know how to play poker, you might have a pretty good hand and you might think, oh, you know what, I'm gonna put a nice bet down on this one, right? But then you're thinking, say say you put down 30 bucks. Say it's a, say it's a, like a $500 game and you put down 30 bucks at a, at a small table, at a regular table. And 30 bucks is an okay bet. You can put 30 bucks down. Now the next guy, the next guy, the next guy, somebody calls, somebody else calls, somebody else calls. Then a the guy goes 100 bucks. And now it's a $500 game. It's 20% of your money. Guy says 100 bucks. Goes boom, boom, boom. Another guy calls, another guy calls. It gets to you. You're the one that put in the 30 in the first place. Most players will bet. You have a king and a jack. You think it's good. Sounds like good cards. You don't know what the next cards are going to be, but you have a king and a jack. That's a pretty strong pair. But you've got... Three, four guys who already put in a hundred dollars, so they think they have something that's going to beat an ace. They could be. It's unlikely anybody who knows what they're doing wouldn't be bluffing in a situation like this. So they would put in their money. That means there's three or four guys who think they can beat an ace. They assume you have an ace if you're playing. So you don't have an ace. You only can be lucky with your king or your jack to get a match that's better than someone else's. Almost certainly, at least some of these people have aces or something that's already better than an ace. And now it's your turn. Most people, nine out of 10 people, put money in because they put 30 in already. And they say, well, I put 30 in already. It's only another 70. Let's see the cards. That is the incorrect strategy. You are facing uncertainty and the cost of finding out what happens has increased dramatically. It's gone up three times. And now you're going to commit, instead of committing less than 10% of your pot, you are now going to commit 20% of your pot into this thing. In fact, yeah, that's where, that's where you're at. So it's the wrong strategy, but most people will do it.
And that's the thing. You're not taking into account the way others are playing the game. You're not taking into account the danger of what you're doing. You're not taking into account your cash management situation. And all these things have to be taken into account or you will not win the game. The game is longer than the hand you're playing. And investing is longer than the hand you're playing. We are going to be doing this for many, many, many years, just not this year. Now is a good time to step back, relax, watch the market, and see what happens for the next quarter. Because earnings are coming up. Earnings are going to be horrific. You know that. But why do you have the why are you holding these companies then? If you know the earnings are going to be horrific, what are you doing? You want to see how horrific they are before you sell? What magical thing is going to happen that's going to keep your stock from falling? I mean, I know what the magical thing is. The magical thing is stimulus, but that's not real. You know, um, when someone goes to the hospital and you put them on life support, those machines can basically keep a corpse alive, technically alive. It can make the heart pump. It can make the lungs move up and down. It can do all kinds of things. they got machines for all that stuff. You can give it the appearance of life. But not a lot. And the same thing goes for people who are totally wrecked and probably going to die and almost definitely going to die. And you stick them on these machines. And of course, they, they, they already had court cases. So they say, that's cruel and unusual punishment. There's a person in there. There's a person trapped inside of that thing. And there are a dead person and you're just keeping them alive. And if you pull that plug, they're dead. The only thing keeping them alive is a machine. That's what this is. This is a market that is being kept alive by machines. It's dead. And somebody, I don't think, it, look, pulling the plug, very painful, very sad. Somebody's going to die. But you have to let everybody move on. And if you don't pull the plug, nobody's going to move on. And we're going to be stuck with this dead, rotting economy for a very, very long time. We have to, we have to accept some social dislocation social change businesses need to change you're keeping alive restaurants that are not um uh not you're keeping alive restaurants you're keeping alive movie theaters you're keeping alive plays all these things could be redesigned from scratch to allow people to dine in this environment you could keep people further away. You could design restaurants with a lot more outdoor space. You could have airflow systems that suck air out and filter it and keep it and keep people safe. You could do a lot of stuff. In fact, the air, airlines are already doing this. Airlines are probably turns out an airline is probably one of the safest places you can be on a plane, not the airport, but the plane. Because they haven't redesigned the airports, they don't have money, but the airlines have money, they redesign the planes. And they are now sucking all the germs out into the filter system and the staff cleans and they're trained and blah, blah, blah. And you are actually very, very, very safe on a plane. Assuming you wear a mask and the guy sitting next to you is, you know, wearing a mask and so on and so forth. So if you follow the protocols, you can be safe. Um, getting Americans to follow protocols is very different, difficult. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, so it, you know, in, 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 the, in the market, it's the same thing, though. There's certain times you don't play. They're not making, oh, the stores, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, so the problem is by propping up all these retailers and propping up all these uh, um, restaurants that should, you know, restaurants that should be going bankrupt. You know why? Uh, the Greek restaurant by my house can't possibly reopen. They're, they're very, it's a crowded place with tight tables and a huge bar that takes up half the space. That is a wrong design for this, for what we're doing now. Another restaurant on the corner of me, though, never had inside tables. You know, I, I live in Florida, so it doesn't matter. But I mean, they never had inside tables. They only have four or five tables inside. They have a little strip of a bar that 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 touches the inside and the outside, so people outside can sit at the bar, people inside can sit at the bar. And then they got outside tables going going along the sidewalks. That that restaurant is fully functional. They, can, they took out a couple of tables inside. There's only like three tables inside now, but those people are way far apart. Um, the, the outside tables are outside tables and everybody's far enough apart where that's a problem. That is a properly designed restaurant for this environment. 
the improperly designed restaurant should be closed so a properly designed restaurant can take its place. But supporting the improperly designed restaurant causes it to take longer for us to fix society. That's 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 the problem too. I mean, that's one of the things that's going on. It's crazy. You know, it's not good. It, I understand it's painful, but instead of being the pain, instead of keeping zombie corporations and zombie rest, you know, all these little businesses and all these big corporations that also have to really rethink their entire strategy at this point, you know, um, maybe maybe movies are never going to work again. Maybe Hollywood needs to sit down. Maybe you have to let AMC and whoever go bankrupt and say, I'm sorry, but movies are not a thing. They have always been breeding rats for germs. Now, am I overreacting? Is the virus going to go past? Maybe. Maybe it'll go past. Maybe we'll start going to movies again. Maybe this thing will, will be a one-time thing. It will be done next year. But you know what? Right now, it's looking pretty bad. And we are keeping these corporations alive. And I have no problem with speculators keeping them alive and so on and so forth. But why is the government bailing these people out? We don't know exactly what they're going to be in the future, but you sure as hell, you know, you're paying AMC to, stay, to not go bankrupt so that the movie theaters can be the way they are. On the other hand, if AMC properly went bankrupt, you would buy those theaters, somebody else would buy the theaters for 10 cents on the dollar, they would rip out 75% of the seats, and uh, and then, and like I said, filtration systems and other stuff to make it safe, and then you have a lovely experience, and you could all go to the movies in, in limited quantities, and maybe they'd raise the price, so you'd pay more money for the movie. So what? Then, then you could have a movie experience and go out with the viruses and all that. As it stands now, they're useless buildings. They're completely empty, useless buildings, wasting the economy, probably not paying their rents, hurting the landlords, hurting the banks. You know, what are you saving it for? The only reason you save it is if a, an intelligent venture capitalist says, I'm willing to, to fund you for a year and keep things going while we see if the virus goes away. If the virus goes away, you'll pay me back and I'll make a lot of money. That's capitalism, that's fine, but it's not the government's responsibility to keep every single business going, no matter how flawed it is at this point. You have to help the people, but not the businesses. You have to bail out the individuals. You know, if the CEO of AMC goes broke and he can't afford his rent, then you help him. But you don't help him keep AMC open if it's a wrong business for this time. If he can't find investors to do it, the government is not their place to do it. Unless it's a vital industry. Movies are not a vital industry. Autos are a vital industry. You know, uh, obviously electric companies, things like that are vital industries. But you can't save everything. And that's what they, you know, it's kind of what they're doing with the Fed. They're just bailing out anybody who wants to issue bonds and and raise capital and whatever to, to run their business into the ground, they'll keep giving you money, but it's not helping anything. We're not, what needs to be, the money, that's the message the market sends you. The money needs to be spent on changing things to adapt to the new environment. And when you pump the money into the dead corporations, you're not changing things, you're refusing to change and you're not adapting. And it's not just the businesses that won't survive, it's the people. So that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, anyway, that was a diatribe. Anybody getting questions for that? <laughs> no, you're all stunned. Huh? All right. Can you discuss your thoughts on the market going forward? I think I hit that one, right, Ben? Assuming another trillion in money from Congress. I, I've been waiting for another trillion so that we could get a nice pop, sell our short, sell our longs and go. Um, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing I mean, obviously, look at the market, though. How do you... How do you get the Congress people to say, yeah, we're going to spend another trillion, and, and a trillion wouldn't even do anything. How do you get them to say, we're going to spend another $2 trillion, probably $3 trillion. The virus is worse now, not better. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, I'm, not, I, I, I'm questioning, and again, we don't know because everybody's being propped up, but I'm telling you that the whole concept of working in offices is possibly going to be on the way out. You know, if I if I'm AT&T and I'm getting by with my with 90% of my people working at home yet I'm paying uh you know, I mean, what, look, I, I don't I don't know if we have that number. We're not going to have that number in any of these. 
Oh, that's how they put it here. They give me Pfizer. Pfizer probably have. But AT&T, because here I am, AT&T. And um, so I'm, I'm AT&T and my, um, my cost of revenue is, is $84 billion, which still leaves me with $97 billion. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I have $67 billion in office in, in operating expenses. So let's say 10% of that is the actual office. I probably hired it. Let's say 10% you're spending on offices around the place. Now, obviously, they have all the little phone stores everywhere. Um, do they need that many? Probably not. Okay? They don't need that many phone stores because people aren't going out anyway. Um, but, but frankly, I have that thing. I, I mean, I, there are... Uh, I, I can think of three or four at t stores within a couple of miles of my house. I mean, they, they really have too many. And you just got to have one place people are comfortable going to. That's all where, where it's like local. Like it should, I mean, to me, I don't understand why they don't do that. Why, why don't they just have one at the mall and that's that? You know, it's like, you know, most things should be like one at the mall and then you're there. It doesn't have to be one every five blocks, but they all compete against each other to be you know, accessible and to get your attention, like while you're thinking about getting a new phone. Like the, the minute your phone breaks, they want you to like drive past an AT&T store and, and go, oh, I need a phone. Um, and my phone did break. My phone, my phone got a little line up the screen and it got brighter and brighter and brighter. And then it started spreading across my screen. And I swear that happened exactly on the second anniversary of my phone. <laughs> it just started, this line appeared. And it was really thin. It didn't bother me at all for like a week. And then there was like, fatter line and they got fatter and fatter and brighter and brighter and I just finally I could barely I mean I had to I could barely read all the words on my screen not 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 I mean barely I mean absolutely could not read all the words on my screen a big thick line of neon on the, in the middle of my screen and it was killing my battery life too so like, it's a insidious thing but basically it was like a sign saying get a new phone even though mine wasn't broken I was very happy with it I had the iPhone 10x and it was great I have the 11 plus now but for no reason other than there was a line in the phone with my 10X. I was waiting for a 5G phone to get a new one. Um, so where were we? Oh, yeah, so AT&T. So how does AT&T, who only drops, you know, 18, only, only, they only drop 18 billion to the bottom line or, or 14 billion after taxes. So what if they could cut half that office expense? That's a 20% bump in profit. So if they figured out in these three months how to, how to get by without an office, why would they go back to the office? Why, why would most people go back to the office when they figured out a way to work and get things done and have their lives and, and, be, and be productive? I mean, not everybody's productive, but you're getting metrics now. See, that's the thing. You, have, you had some people worked at home. Sure, of course. But... It's very hard to do a serious study on how efficient your company is with everybody working at home because everybody's scared to pull that trigger and try it. Everybody has just been forced to try it. So if you want to know what the companies of the future are, I'm, I'm fairly positive that very few companies are seeing significant uh, in, uh, impact from having people work at home. And if you're not having an impact from people working at home, then what the hell are you buying them an office for? Why are you spending the money it costs to give them a desk and a computer, which they have at home, and get them a, a, the chairs and give them the coffee and make the air conditioning and electricity and blah, 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 blah. Just pay them a little more and let them stay home. Give them money for their, for their equipment and so on and so forth. And then you have to have, if you have an office, you need an office manager, and then you need cleaning staff and all this other stuff. And obviously you're paying the rent per square foot for where they are a lot of burden costs when you have an employee and for what if it doesn't even make them more efficient what the hell are you doing so yeah i had i had an idea it's like i'm trying to figure this out because i work with people who aren't here and i was thinking of giving them like little boxes or something but then i'm like you don't really want someone to always be able to just come on the screen whenever they feel like it because you just you know i'm just hanging out at, i'm hanging out at my desk in my office and don't necessarily want people staring at me all the time but um on the other hand 
they could knock and I could go yes and I could hit a button and they can be on the screen and be right in front of me just like if, as if you're talking to them in person. So I think we need to do that. We need to have like some kind of telepresence things for specific people. So in other words, th this telepresence unit comes on and a certain person is in front of me. Well, wouldn't that be a certain person? I'm not tied to that person. But basically it's just a dedicated screen, a video phone basically. But instead of being your phone or your iPad or your computer, which you're using, just an extra little screen and people who want to talk to you get on the extra little screen and you have conferences and stuff. And of course I have multiple screens on my computer, so I'm kind of doing that. But I still don't want it on my computer. I kind of want like a separate thing, like where where people should be that's not my computer. Because I didn't, like whenever I'm talking to people on the conference or something like that, I'm always like, oh, I need that screen. And I'm like, I have to move things around. I, I want a dedicated one. And there should be a simple dedicated one. Because I don't think most people are sitting at home with like five, six screens around them like I do. But we should do something like that to make it better for conferencing. And uh, also easier, obviously. Oh, man, people cannot use things. People can't use Zoom. People can't use WhatsApp. WhatsApp is great, by the way. I hated it. When I started, but when I found out there was a PC version and you can keep most of it on your PC and not use the phone for everything, it became much better. It's actually quite good on the PC. Um, you can't make phone calls on the PC, but at least you can do all your organization of all the all the chats, and that's kind of nice. And and yeah, I know it's not that much better than an Apple Chat, but not everybody can use Apple Chat, so that's the problem. So you know, Apple's proprietariness is what's killing them there. And the Europeans, of course. That's how they can call you for free. So they all do that. So anybody, if you're doing business around the world, you really want to have it. Anybody, anybody outside the U.S. uses WhatsApp a lot to communicate because it's a uh, free comp, free calling, and also excellent, easy, you know, group calls, and not video calls because who needs a video call? They have a nice little a little circle pops up with a picture of the person you're talking to, and you have a conversation like a normal human being instead of worrying about like what's my background look like, what do I look like, so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, bottom line is all this stuff can completely be done without without the use of offices. And people are learning that. And I don't think we're going back that way. I don't think we can go back to the office. But then, uh-oh, now what's going to happen in the cities? They're going to collapse. What if people don't go back to these offices? What if It's not just the offices. It's all the stores around it. It's all the people who support the offices. It's office workers. It's office staff. It's, it's all the people who invested in these office buildings who never imagined that they wouldn't be full anymore. And then it's the banks who lent the money to the people who invested in the office. So if you think this thing is done economically, you are so wrong. There's going to be ripple effects of this thing for years to come. And, not, and, and honestly, they're not good ones. You got you got a whole kids who've skipped a year of school basically. We have a whole year of kids basically, uh, not a year. Basically, these kids from what what like March until the end of the year, so spring semester basically, they missed it. There's a half a year gap in kids' education, and let me tell you something. I know that because in Jersey, what did they do? Um, <clears throat> I don't know the full story. <clears throat> as far as I could tell, my kids were young, so it wasn't a big deal, but, it'd be, but I had to teach them math because something happened and they switched curriculums for math in the middle of the year. And they ended up like not teaching them the whole year's worth of whatever it was, like algebra or whatever, whatever they were at on at the time. And they, the next year, when they went to school, they were supposed to have already had algebra because they changed their minds or something happened. And my kids were like, not not both of them, they had different things. I had one was geometry and one was algebra. But they had different problems. But the point was, they both didn't learn enough of, of the thing they were supposed to know to progress to the next level, you know, trigonometry and whatever. So they didn't know enough to move to the next level. So I had to sit there and teach them how to do trig and how to do algebra and how to do that stuff. Um, instead of the teacher, because the teachers were like basically trying to teach your class full of people who were like dragging way, way behind what the lesson plan was because they never took the time to make it up. So 
what's happening now. All these kids, and believe me, all the all the remote learning was basically a joke. Nobody was prepared for it. They didn't have a good plan. Uh, it was the way they did it was was very haphazard. So I'm I'm going to say basically this is just as bad. I think they got all these kids that have missed a half year of school. It's going to take two or three years before that catches up and fix it. But meanwhile, in two or three years, a lot of those kids are going to graduate and look for jobs or go to college, and they got and they've got gaps. It's not going to get better very quickly again. And these are ripple effects. These are ripple effects in the economy. Like me, I can't do math today. It's very, it slows things down if I can't do math. Usually I do it in my head. If I can't do math, it slows things down. Same thing, okay? This kid is gonna one day be a, a construction foreman on a site and he's gonna sit there and he's gonna go, damn, I got, you're gonna get the calculus wrong like that and the building's gonna fall down. And it'll all be because of the virus 20 years ago. You remember that virus? That's, when, that's why he made that mistake. You're never gonna trace it back. He's going to have a guy who can't do math as well as you. So ripple effects, all kinds of stuff going on, and everything is crazy. That is my prognosis for the future, in case you're asking. <laughs> but anyway, doom, gloom. No, so, I mean, look, there's going to be huge opportunities. That's why I want to have money on the side. You don't know what the opportunity is going to be, but there are going to be some gigantic opportunities. There are always orange crashes. In recessions and depressions, those are the best times in the world to have money on the side. We need to be flexible and we need to protect ourselves. That's the most important thing. Uh, let's see. Wilson, Alan Wilson says, oh, wait, 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 wait. There's two things. Okay, that's not fine. Alan says, you mentioned uh, coffee is a cheap buy at its current price. Zero Hedge had an article a weekend about Brazil producing more coffee over the last year and the currency losing value, making it favorable to sell inventory even at lower prices. Uh, is this consideration along with COVID? Well, I mean, Brazil is a big coffee producer. So yeah, 3.8 million, what is that? I'm not sure what, what MM is, but um, I don't know what that is in proportion to the world coffee supply. So of course it's a factor, there's always a factor. Um, they had good production, but you know, somebody else might have bad production. Like the other side, India might have bad production. We don't know yet. And it always goes up and down, but just historically, it's a, it's a good price. Now, again, problem with coffee though, offices. I don't drink five cups of coffee a day at home. I don't drink it in the office either, but I'm saying, I mean, I, people do though, right? I mean, people drink five cups of coffee while they're working in the daytime. And, um, you know, they, they come in, they have a coffee, especially when the machine is free, forget it. So they come in and have a coffee, they go to lunch coffee, they take a coffee break, they do this, they do that, and it's, and it's crazy. I mean, I, in my office, it was like that anyway. Not and I, and I was not a coffee person, but once in a while I'd have a coffee because that's what everybody was doing all the time. Um, but you know, you know me, I'm a tea guy, so I'm not, I'm not really a big coffee drinker, but, but you're basically forced to have coffee. Like you go to a meeting and everybody's having coffee, you feel like an idiot, not. Um, so, that probably hurts coffee consumption a lot. So I, I'm certainly not thinking coffee is going to be booming, but I do think it's cheap. And I and and if Brazil is bucking a trend, that's fine with a devalued currency. So happy for them that their currency sucks. But in reality, you know, this is a pretty low price for coffee. And well, there you go. Look at it going. So <laughs> what you're saying is still when coffee was 95, you said it was too cheap. <laughs> So, so there you go. I mean, so you've got a fact, okay? That uh, your your fact is valid. It's a it's a valid fact, but it's only one factor. You have to take into account how much is that compared to global consumption. What does that really mean? And all you're talking about is one demand piece. What is every other country doing? Is the total global supply of coffee more or less, and is total global demand more or less? And I said I thought this was valid. I, at no point during this crash did I say buy coffee, but when it hits a low that's been very sustainable, I said, let's put money into coffee. And that was in the middle of June. You're right, it was right about here. I said, let's buy coffee. Why? I have a value line. Because I believe there's an exact value for things. And when something gets to a point where it's irresistibly cheap, I buy it. And when, we make, when it gets to 110, I would sell it because that's too much because of the uncertainty in the environment. But you know what? That's a lot of money between 95 and 110. So that's where the decision is based. My decision isn't based on now. I wouldn't buy it now. We bought it at the bottom. That was irresistible. This is not irresistible. 
but it's certainly not based on just the Brazil thing. There's, there's so many factors, it's really hard to say. I don't know how much coffee people drink at home. I don't know what consumption is. I don't know how the trend changes, but I do know that was an excellent support line for coffee. It's so cheap that I remember last year, two years ago, when we got down to that price, they stopped making it in places like Brazil because the farmers can't live. You go below 100 on coffee and the farmers can't afford to make it. It costs them more to make the coffee than it does to uh, than they collect in revenues. That was a big concern. You can't sustain this, just like you can't pull gold out of the ground for less than $800 an ounce. Therefore, if gold gets close to $800 an ounce, I feel very good about buying it because it costs that much to make it. And that's not even counting the cost of the mine and the cost of the uh, people and your staff and everything else. In other words, the running cost of your company is part of the cost of pulling gold out of the ground. But the raw cost of pulling gold out of the ground is about 800 bucks. So I, I don't care if you've got the most efficient company in the world, gold costs 800 bucks. So when you see gold, not now, obviously, but when you see gold go to a thousand bucks an ounce, I start buying. Cause I'm like, it ain't going below eight. And unless somebody invents a new way of extracting gold or producing gold like diamonds, diamonds crashed because artificial diamonds just, uh, artificial diamonds are basically indistinguishable from real diamonds. That's what destroyed the diamond market. They, they figured out how to make a diamond cheaper than a diamond. So that's the end of the diamond market. You've destroyed the diamond market. Whether it happens slowly or, or quickly is irrelevant. You've destroyed the diamond market. Now, knowing that happened though, we still bought Zales. Why? Because Zales doesn't sell you a diamond. They could give, you know, they obviously they do sell you a diamond. They make money on that. But I guarantee they make money on the artificial diamonds too. And you still need a ring. You still need the holder. You still need the little side gems. Everything has to be done. You know, people don't buy a diamond, a piece of rock for an engagement ring and hand it over to somebody. They have to, have to get the whole thing done. So Zales still has a business. The fact that diamonds crash doesn't destroy Zales, but it was priced like it did. So you have to look at the bigger picture. You have to think of all the connected pieces. You have to think about how one thing affects another and what this story means. And so you say, okay, Brazil had some stuff. Okay, what percent? Here you go. Um, watch. So uh uh world okay top coffee producers it's always it's always the thing like figuring out the thing here you go brazil 2.59 metric tons now you just said to me three point something right so this is very interesting we can quickly get to the bottom of this you said they produce 3.8 more units so are they producing three they can't be producing 3.8 million more tons that wouldn't make any sense uh, let's assume that you're saying they're producing 3.8 instead of 2.5. That's a lot. They are also the world's top coffee producers. So that should be a hell of a lot. So that would be a big effect. There's a lot of extra coffee on the market. The question is, how much of the total is that? Well, <clears throat> if we assume the top 10 are 20 or at least, uh, I would say probably 40% of the production. So four, five, six, seven. So let's say it's seven to eight, and then we said that's 40%, so that would be 16, and then half of that is 20. So Brazil produces more than 10% of the world's coffee. And you're saying that they added one another another 5% almost to the production. So now there's 105% more coffee than last year. But the question is, did India have a bad year? Did Indonesia have a good year? Did Colombia have a good year? Probably Colombia did. They're close to Brazil. And how's Vietnam on the other side of the world? Are they having so much luck as Brazil? Then you have to figure out what's that percentage. And then you have to look about consuming countries. So it's top coffee, consuming countries. Oh, well, that's useless. Okay, then that's that's a whole complicated thing. But so now you have to do population, blah, blah, blah. So we don't, we don't, we're not learning anything from that, but that's all right. We are learning something. It's kind of weird, isn't it? So Iceland, Denmark, Netherlands. I guess if it's cold, you drink a lot of coffee. And what's this going to tell us? Not much. Nope, still telling us kilograms per person. Holy crap, people drink a lot of coffee. We don't. Look at that. We barely drink coffee compared to Canada. It's crazy. But see, Brazil drinks a lot of coffee, and they're in a hot place. Russia doesn't drink much coffee. They don't like coffee, huh? 
I know China doesn't like coffee. Japan, okay. Uh, Norway, Europe, not big on coffee, I guess. Anyway, so we're learning stuff. <laughs> anyway, the bottom line is, though, it, it, what hasn't changed, if Brazil's producing a lot of coffee and they've had favorable conditions, they've got low currency, those are things that move that bar, which is usually at 100 that you take into consideration, the $100 market, because normal currencies, normal events. But if Brazil is producing cheaper, they can produce more coffee. But you know what? All that does is put Vietnamese farmers out of business. Because uh, it doesn't help them if, if Brazil has a lower currency base and they can produce coffee while the guy in Vietnam is saying, dude, I can't make money at this. I'm losing money making coffee. I got to stop. That's what happens. And then the production goes offline. Then, it, then, it, then it, it might shift to Brazil if they can keep their currency that low. And believe me, the way their virus is going, they're going to keep their currency that low. It's another disaster. That's what happens. All right. Anyway. I got to cut this thing off. I got to get a meeting after this, actually, which I can't even talk. Um, offices, if you're collaborating in product development, it's very hard to have smart I, I agree with that. In fact, I had a meeting. Oh, I had my first meeting since the virus started. I went to an in-person meeting. And we went to somebody's house. They had a very large table. We all sat fairly far apart at the table. But we had a proper meeting, and, and it is. You can't replace that. I'm sorry. There's no, I've had, I've had dozens and dozens of video conferences and you cannot replace sitting with people and having a meeting. It's not the same. So I agree with that, but we have to find a safe and good way to do that. Um, and perhaps they should take over office buildings on social days. Wait a minute. IBM made a pretty good turn on this one in some of their BU last year. I think the schools really need to be online. Oh yeah, that's right. My kids are freaking out about going back to school. They say there's no way that's safe. Uh, colleges, of course. And perhaps they can take over office buildings to social distance. I don't know what they're going to do, but yeah, you're right. That would be smart. If they took over office buildings, made much bigger classrooms with much less people, something like that. This is, I mean, how do you have a lecture hall? How do you, that's, I think that's what my kids are thinking because Maddie's, Maddie's a, a sophomore and Jack is going to be a freshman. And how do you take over lecture halls? What are you going to do? How do you fix that? I'm not even sure the economics of that is going to be now. So is NLY a cell? I know why the mortgage read they're not they don't hold property so they're not really the same thing but on the whole I, I i certainly think that's it's too nervous to hold i think i think oh i think all those all those dividend stocks tend to be in that category it's just too nervous to hold it's like i don't know how long this is going to be sustainable uh we're still keeping along the same place we were before i mean nothing's nothing's improving i have 3500 shares of at t stock at 30 would it be wise to sell some after the ex dividend date? Not really, Robin. I mean, if you if you want it for the dividend, keep it for the dividend. Just buy some calls to cover it. If you want to ask me about that, let's do it in the web in the in chat because we can easily talk about it there. But just cover it. You know, it's AT and T. You want to talk about it there? I got I got to go. Look, so I can't really do this. Um, so we go T, and if we look at 21, uh, 2022, so you have the stock for um uh for 30 so you own it at 30 and you say oh should i sell it i i think 30 is a great price for at t so i wouldn't sell it but it depends on what else you know what you expect to do with that money over the over the medium term um at 30 you're going to collect um i'm going to say a dollar 80 in dividends so you got a dollar 80 dividend coming to you you don't really, you know, why do you want to give up that income? It's not nothing. And um, after the dividend, sure, it's going to change. But you know what you can do? You can sell the 28 calls of 2022. And you can sell them for $4.20 or for, well, 410. I'd go 420. Oh, no, it's down today. So maybe 410. All right, so you sell them for 410. So that means that you've actually collected $32.10. Okay, your dividend. And you have a thirty dollars stock, so you have now been paid thirty two ten for your stock. You are protected. So if AT and T goes down to twenty eight, your short call will expire worthless, but you will still have your stock, and you will not have lost any money. You already got paid for it. It'll lower the basis on your stock to twenty six dollars. In fact, right? Obviously, if you sell a call for four dollars and you paid thirty, your net is now twenty six. So when you get called away at twenty eight. You make two dollars instead of what you make instead of uh basically even that you're doing now but not only that though but you're going to continue to collect your dividend for two years 
at $1.80 and $1.80, you can get 360 more back in dividends on your $26 stock because you only have $26 left in play. And if AT&T goes up, someone's going to pay you 30 and you're going to make $4 on your $26 stock. So you have $4 plus 360 in dividends. So that's 760 against your $26, like 30 something percent back on 26 bucks. So would I sell? Not if you want to make 30% in, in two years, you know, then just cover it. You know, we, we may have a downturn. It may go down to 24, 25. You know what you're doing is a 25 and your net is 26. You sell some 25 falls to three or four bucks. And then you, and then you drop your basis to 22. And the thing is, if you don't believe AT&T has a long-term value of 22, even if we have a depression, then you should be getting out. But that's what your decision should be based on, not just panic, not just, you know, getting out of something. It's it's perfectly good stock. It's a phone company. Are people going to stop using phones because it's a depression? No. Are people going to stop using cell phones? They might not upgrade them as much, but they're still going to use the damn cell phones. It's going to be really hard to hurt AT&T. AT&T already made it through one depression, right? They're not, they're not going to go away. People still need to talk. They still need to communicate more so than ever now. Think about how much more we're doing with these phones. You're constantly, I know I am, I'm constantly on the phone because I can't go out, because I can't go to meetings. I'm constantly on the phone. So I don't think that's going to change. All right, last two because I got to go. Uh, schools need a real person to be online, to a real person not online. I agree with that. I mean, it's it's or or they just need to redo the the the, the online to be more personable. You know, and again, it goes back to see. This is the thing we don't invest. This is the problem. We're not investing. Um, the teacher needs to have either a screen full of students, or there should be some specially designed thing that lets him look at all the videos of all the students without it being on a screen, so he has access to his screen. And and again, that's the problem. Nobody nobody said, let's give the teachers a second monitor. Let's like buy every teacher a second monitor. This monitor is for the video of their students so that they see all of their students in the class as if it's a class, like maybe above their original monitor. And we see the whole class like laid out in a nice wide angle on a professional kind of monitor, not saying, hey, teacher, use your laptop at home, you underpaid bastard, and figure this out. That's what we're doing to these teachers. Instead of saying, hey, teacher, here's a $2,000 grant. Go out and, see, and here's what we recommend using. Go to the store and get this. You have a $2,000 credit card to go do this with. That's how you stimulate the economy. Give all the teachers a $2,000 credit card and say, here is what we recommend for AV equipment for your home so that you can teach effectively online. That's how you stimulate the economy. You stimulate it with a purpose that accomplishes something. Damn it. All right, anyway. <laughs> KC is Arabica. Brazil and South Afri American countries produce Arabica. Asia only produces Robusta. Right, but we drink both. I mean, I know we mostly drink Arabica, but um, yes, I know there is a difference. Uh, and coffee is coffee, frankly. If there's a shortage of coffee in one part of the world, then obviously they start drinking the other kind. Apple closing more than 30 stores tomorrow. You Well, they should. Uh, anybody, anybody who has any kind of store in Florida should be closed. This is wrong. Florida and Texas and Arizona are, are dangerous, dangerous hotspots of a virus. And we're acting like the mall should be open. Well, how come if the wind blows in my town, they declare a state of emergency? And yet 10,000 people got a virus yesterday and they refused to do anything about it. The hell's wrong with this country? Don't get me started. I'm I'm off. I'm done. All right. <laughs> anyway, I love it. All right. Anyway, back to the market. So everybody have fun. We're gonna keep trading. We're gonna do do fun things. And uh, at the moment, obviously, nothing is going down. There's no particular reason to panic and sell. But I'm gonna start. I don't know. I mean, I want to shut everything down. I'd feel better about shutting everything down. Um, but I guess we're gonna try to just at least keep some things open for trading. And I'm going to figure out what positions I really can't live without, which frankly, last time I reviewed it was most of them because I love our position so much. But now I've got to look at it from the point of view of like a market I really don't believe is going to keep going up. I really, really don't believe this is going to last. And I think I think any day now, and again, I thought that all 2007 because I saw the same kind of thing. This cannot possibly be sustained that's what happened in 2007 and what happened is bush put out those cut remember the rebates bush had was like three thousand bucks 
It wasn't twelve hundred bucks like Trump. It was like three thousand dollars he was sending out. Uh, he didn't buy. He didn't buy that. He couldn't buy that election. But he's, you know, so, so what, I don't see how Trump thinks he's buying this one. Um, but of course, the Bush stimulus was actually designed by a guy who was, although he was an idiot, he kind of cared. Like he wanted to do a good job. He wasn't capable of doing a good job, but he kind of wanted to do a good job. Donald Trump does not try to do a good job, doesn't want to do a good job. Donald Trump wants to make Donald Trump and Donald Trump's friends and Donald Trump's family money. That's This whole thing's a scam for him. He is in no way, shape, or form trying to help anybody. And that's the difference. Because $1,200 as a, as a stimulus check to be locked in your home for three months with no job and no nothing and, and, and the money doesn't even, I mean, it would have been better if you just sent people freaking masks and told them to wear them. Then we'd be in way better shape than we are now. Anyway, stop. I got to stop. Okay, I got to go. <laughs> I'm going to be late for my thing. Very nice talking to you guys. Sorry we can't be more cheery, but that wasn't so bad because it wasn't so bad I'd be able to talk about the virus. But it wasn't so bad. Anyway, so we'll see what happens. We'll watch the charts. And I, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if I can be three days in a row. We've been up. So honestly, you know, it's hard to sell when you're up three days in a row. But at some point, we need to take some money off the table. So I will figure it out. And we will uh, revisit this discussion next week. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Appreciate it.